Hey everybody, welcome back to Hot Hardware's Two and a Half Geeks. It is Monday, March 14th. I'm Dave Altavilla here with my uh, partners in crime, the illustrious Marco Cipetta, the fabulous Fedorid Paul Lilly. How are you guys doing today? Marco, you are um, in the rainy state of Connecticut, that's what I'm told. I am. I, I'm doing. I feel like I'm in a pretty good mood for some odd reason. I'm not sure why. It is dark and gloomy outside and rainy, and uh, I have a gale warning, so I hear stuff flying around outside. But generally, things are okay. There you go, Paul. Any gale warnings in your neighborhood? No, it's rainy here too, but I don't care. I'm I'm feeling good. I was sick earlier in the month. Felt like The Walking Dead, but everything's good this week. So. Yeah, we missed you too. You know, you can't you can't take too many sick days in this gig, dude. It was painful for us all. <laughs> kidding, <laughs> kidding. Uh, we're glad you're well. And um, th the nice thing about webcasts is that even if you were still sick, nobody else would catch it. Um, although That's they'll true. figure out how to transfer human viruses over the net before you know it, I'm sure. Um, but uh, rather than talking about the plague and all this other stuff, why don't we talk about some tech, because that's what we're here to talk about. we got a lot to talk about, actually. It's been, I don't know, probably a couple, three weeks anyways. Uh, we've been remiss, but it's good to be back here broadcasting again. Um, we have had a ton of technology to, to chew through lately. There's been a you know gaggle of notebooks, uh, lots of storage stuff, um, unbelievable amount of, of releases right after CES where everybody teased going into CES and then now all of a sudden everything's available to ship and we're buried. So that's a good problem to have. Marco, you checked out something from the good folks at Samsung, the portable SSD T3 wicked fast USB-C storage, right? Yes, absolutely. I have it right here before I talk about it. Finally, we have live comments on the YouTube page. It looks like that's going to be working, so that <laughs> I, I will be looking at that. If you want to participate live, uh, comment there. I'm going to check it out. Um, I will also monitor the Facebook page, so if you comment there, I'll try to bounce back and forth and see it. Um, yeah, but that that is all working right now. Yay. So this is the Samsung... Let me get the name exactly right. Samsung Portable SSD T3. This particular one I am holding is a one terabyte model. So this little guy here, one terabyte of solid state storage. It's essentially a Samsung SSD 850 Evo inside a little controller with USB 3.1 connectivity. Of course, that's backwards compatible to USB 3, USB 2. You really don't want to plug this into USB 2 because you're just wasting all that performance. But when plugged into USB 3, this thing is, is crazy fast. So Samsung's offering them in capacities from 250 gig on up to 2 terabytes. Now, they used to, the, the T1, which is actually a similar drive, was only available up to 1 terabyte. This new one goes up to 2 terabytes, and it's rated for up to 450 megabytes per second transfers, you know, over this, you know, little tiny USB-C cable right here. Now, I plugged it into our test machine. I actually was able to compare it to some internal SSDs, and while it's not quite as fast as an internal drive, the thing's crazy fast, like in, a, in Crystal Diskmark, for example, 395 megs per second in writes, 410 reads, you know, in an actual benchmark. So pretty, pretty cool, fast little drive right here. If you need fast portable storage, I mean, with, you know, a nice rugged enclosure, it's kind of got good looks too. This thing is pretty awesome. So, yeah, I was just looking at the, the benchmark chart, and I had it up there for everybody to take a look at as well. What you're talking about here is external storage that competes with, well, pretty darn close, with, uh, a standard internal SATA drive, right? Basically, yeah. The, it, it, it's the same guts as one of the internal SSD 850 Evos. It just has that you know USB kind of bridge going on there. So there's some performance lost going to USB, plus USB doesn't queue up commands quite the same as a, a true SATA connection would. So there is some performance loss there, but in terms of like big file transfers, it's pretty quick. You know, you can get half, almost half a gig a second. Pretty so awesome. It, it's interesting when you get that kind of bandwidth. Now you're talking about certainly you can you can back things up um, faster, you know, and you know, have have that um, access. But now you're talking about 
it's some in some cases some some different use cases, right? So maybe uh, it's a little bit more capable in terms of streaming media. Maybe folks that want to do some expansion. Of course, you're talking USB C, so maybe you need an adapter there. I'm trying to think of other applications, but consoles could use that bandwidth. But you're going to be limited over a USB three connection there, right? Some of the newer consoles versus USB C. So. Well, it's still USB three, so you still get you still get that kind of performance out of USB three. You'd still get the four to five hundred. You might probably get a little bit less on that. Would you? Was enough no, bandwidth? No, you get it on USB three. It, it, it would do it. Yep. All right. Cool. Cool. Paul, you checked out the previous gen of this, right? I did. I have that one right here. It looks a little different. This one's all black. But uh, yeah, that was the previous version, and that was, um, from what I remember, was pretty fast for the time. It's not as fast as the one Marco has now. But uh, yeah, it's. What I like about it is how thin it is. Look at that. That blows me away you can get a terabyte in that space now. Yeah, this one's a terabyte as well. I mean, it sticks right in your pocket. Can't, if there's no bulge. You can't tell that you're carrying anything in there. It's pretty neat. Uh, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry that there's no bulge in your pocket. Yeah, I was going to say, you <laughs> can't track that. Is that a terabyte in your pocket or you're happy to see me joke? <laughs> So yeah, actually, this one is up to two terabytes that you can get it in. So I, I believe the two terabyte drive sells for like eight hundred and forty nine bucks right now. The one terabyte model that I looked at, you can get it for about four hundred and thirty bucks, and it's actually a, about the same performance as the original. There, there's still the same guts inside. It's just different connector, different enclosure, slightly different firmware. But you know, depending on the platform you're plugging it into and what software you're running. They're kind of on par. You just get the uh, the updated metal enclosure, which which also has some thermal benefits. Apparently, the originals might have throttled in some conditions where this one's not supposed to throttle quite as much. It actually didn't throttle on me at all. So really, really cool little drive. If you need fast storage, you know, if you have a ton of portable apps or you know you like to have all of your installers with you, you know, a terabyte in your pocket, super fast, right here. It's it's a very very cool drive. Excellent, excellent. I'm surprised we haven't seen more of that kind of stuff. Um, you know, just getting to that bandwidth. Um, Samsung seems to be leading the charge there. This is their second iteration of this technology, and there's certainly other external SSDs, um, you know, backup drives and what have you that are much lower bandwidth, though, right? I mean, th is this not the fastest thing in the market in that in that setup and form factor? I mean, in this kind of form factor, yes. Now, technically, you could buy a fast USB 3.1 enclosure and any 2.5-inch SSD, right. put it together, and have similar performance. But in this kind of little, tiny, compact, slim form factor, there's nothing quite like this right now. Cool, cool, cool. Well, let's talk about something else from Samsung. Um, we are just now putting it through its paces and... Uh, Stress testing, if you will, uh, digging in deep to the uh, to the to the benchmarks and the review process. But um, I am actually taking a look at the Samsung Galaxy S7, and it looks like, unfortunately, right now. Oh, here we go. It's gonna it's gonna light up for me. Uh, it was powered down, but but this is the Galaxy S7. This is Samsung's latest 5.1 inch model. Okay, uh, the S7 Edge is a little bit larger, five and a half inch. This is the black version. Um, Verizon enabled, um, and uh, we are actually stepping through the process right now with this. But uh, first impressions, beautiful phone built. I mean, it, what's interesting about this is they're very sleek and slim, uh, not as thin as an iPhone, um, but it feels so substantial and solid in the hand. Like it's just, it feels really good. Um, it, there's just a there's just a sturdiness and a build quality here that's super tight. Um, and super quality that, you know, interestingly enough, we used to sort of uh, pick at Samsung for previously in the previous gen, like the Galaxy S5 on back. Galaxy S6, they turned it up a notch. This phone seems um, even better that way. It's got, um, you know, uh, beveled edges in the back now. Um, the edge has beveled edges on the front and back. Um, just a beautiful, beautiful setup for a phone. And performance-wise, this thing kicks some serious butt. I actually did a little sort of quick throwdown, uh, Samsung Galaxy S7 versus iPhone 6S performance showdown. 
And you know, I'm still. I want to go through all of the different benchmarks and corner case uh, tests with with these phones. Uh, Paul's got uh, his iPhone 6s Plus that we we vow to to beat on a little bit more as well. Um, but um, it showed us that I'm going to see if I can share this out real quick. It showed us that the um, Qualcomm Snapdragon. Here we go. The Qualcomm Snapdragon 820 with its Cairo CPU and Adreno 530 graphics is actually significantly faster in some tests than the iPhone 6s and the Apple A9 processor. Um, here we're, we're showing uh, GFX Bench, T-Rex off-screen. Hopefully you guys can see that pretty well. Let me see if I can maybe even expand it a touch um, so you can really get zoomed in. But as you can see here, the Galaxy S7 on top, 90 frames per second. The iPhone 6s Plus at 79 frames per second. Then we come down to the GFX Manhattan off-screen test. Um, this is a little bit higher end um, WebGL, OpenGL, not WebGL, OpenGL graphics test. A little bit more stress test here. Galaxy S7, 48 frames per second. iPhone 6S Plus, 39 and a half frames per second. Um, so those are two very graphics intensive tests. Then when you come down to 3D Mark Ice Storm, which also is graphics intensive, but it's it's also it also calculates things like physics performance. Um, the Galaxy S7 once again on top uh, with a total 3D Mark score of uh, like a thousand points higher than the iPhone 6X Plus, um, significantly faster, almost 2x in physics calculation throughput and performance. But here, 3D Mark Ice Storm is showing graphics performance trails a little bit for the Galaxy S7 versus the iPhone 6S Plus. So there's there's a bit of a toss-up there. Um, in CPU throughput, you've got a quad-core, again, quad-core Snapdragon uh, 820 with that Cairo engine versus the iPhone 6S Plus and its A9 dual-core. Um, here in Geekbench, you can see some of the top scores are from octa-core processors. Uh, the Huawei Mate 8, the Galaxy S6, uh, previous generation uh, has an octa-core Exynos chip and so as you can see slightly better multi-core multi-threaded performance in the yellow bars here up top for those phones but if you come down just a little bit a uh, couple hundred points away in multi-threaded you've got the Galaxy S7 and the iPhone 6S Plus here again the Galaxy S7 edges out the iPhone 6S Plus in single core performance the two phones the GS7 and the iPhone 6 S, um, blow away the, the competition um, in single core throughput, but the iPhone 6 S um, edges out the Galaxy S7. So it's an interesting sort of back and forth with what looks like Edge going to Samsung right now, and it's impressive to see what this new Snapdragon 820, Qualcomm Snack and Snapdragon 820 is the SOC on board the uh, GS7. Um, it's impressive um, to be sure, but what's also impressive is what Apple gets done with a dual-core A9 chip. Um, certainly they have a, a strong graphics score, but just two cores, um, they're able to compete very handily versus uh, the latest Qualcomm chip. W what do you guys think? I was, I was impressed as all heck with the handset. It feels very balanced, great performance, beautiful AMOLED display, best displays in the industry for smartphones, period, in my opinion. Um, camera's awesome. I've been playing with that, too. What do you guys think about this thing? That's what I was going to ask you if you've taken any pictures with it, especially uh, the low light pictures, because I know that was a point of focus during their their impact event. Yeah, um, I have, and um, actually, you know what's interesting is that the Galaxy S6. Uh, I actually I actually run an S6 Edge Plus for my daily driver, and this phone takes awesome pictures too. Um, the GS7. It, it, it's at least as good for sure. Is it better? Uh, I'm still looking at that. Um, it it seems to have um, better saturation, a little bit better light performance, as you said, uh, as you asked about in low light conditions. Um, it seems to be a little bit more responsive there. You get a little bit, a little bit better saturation, a little bit better uh, color balance. Um, but I really got to A B it some more. Um, the camera's awesome, though. It's it's excellent. It's at least as good, and Samsung, argu arguably with the GS6 line, had one of the better cameras in the market. I, I think at least as good as an iPhone 6, uh, iPhone 6S. 
Um, but it's close. It's darn close. I got to look at it some more. It's 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 an excellent camera to be sure. You know, Marco, any questions? <laughs> no questions. I got to play with it um, in in New York before they, you know, before the launch. I, I I got to mess with the phone for a little while and you know did the duck t did the dunk test in the water and played with the camera and you know got to handle it. I think Samsung made a lot of good choices with the phone. Um, the the camera not only does it take good shots but it it autofocuses really quickly. You, yeah. the the water resistance and dust resistance is back. Micro SD expansion is back. It's got a great screen. It's got a premium feel. Um, the base model has 32 gigs of storage. Um, just lots of lots of good refinements. I think Samsung did, did some really good stuff with that phone. Yeah, yeah, the, the, yeah. I forgot to mention the SD SD card expansion, micro SD, right up top on the top edge of the phone. You've got. Uh, You've got a SIM tray and uh, micro SD expansion slot. Um, is it combo? Yeah, I believe it's combo. Um, so, you know, just excellent, excellent uh, setup. Uh, really high quality phone. Um, good performance. And we are going through the, the paces on the review right now. Um, but, you know, again, what's impressive to me is that Snapdragon 820. I'm also detecting that battery life on this little fella is going to be slightly better uh, than the well. It's going to be better than the previous gen GS6. When you go to the edge, you go up to I think it's a 3600 milliamp hour battery, 3650, um, or maybe it's 3750. I'd have to look up the specs. Um, anyways, a significantly larger battery in the edge, which which is a five and a half inch device. Um, that thing's going to have killer battery life, I am sure. Right now, this seems like. Um, Marginally better than than the Galaxy S6 for the 5.1 inch standard GS7. So, um, you know, Samsung's really, really hitting um, hitting on all cylinders with this. This is an example of a refinement in a phone that um, I think you know uh, really just shows well. They're, they've they've listened. They've they've taken to to heart some uh, customer demand like that SD card slot and additional exp uh, storage expansion. Um, and again, I. Displays. I'm spoiled. I, you know, I've been on Samsung's phone since the GS5, and that Super AMOLED technology to me, I can't, I can't unsee it. Even versus an iPhone, um, I just think it blows everything else away. I checked out the Nexus 6P. We've reviewed that. No, nope, doesn't it doesn't impress me from a display standpoint like the Samsung displays. I don't know if I can get away from that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Speaking they, of displays, we were talking before that you like. Uh, you prefer the edge because of the bigger screen. I'm curious though, do you use the the screens on the edge to feed those features at all? No, no. I'll be honest. That's that is um, that is a a gimmick right now, in in my opinion, for for my use case, uh, in terms of a feature, uh, the actual you know edge. What you do get, um, and, and the edge features that they've built so far. Now, theoretically. Uh, and I've got to look at the edge. We're, we're getting an edge in as well, the GS7 edge we're getting in. Um, I, I believe Samsung has built some new features um, that are a little bit more useful. I've got to look at that a little bit more closely. On the GS6 Edge Plus, um, no, I, I find no utility. There's there's this thing called Friends Edge or um, different sort of functionality, add contacts and quick shortcuts on the edge. To me, it just feels like an expansion of the home screen um, and gives you another place to put some more quick shortcuts and things like that. Um, there's some notifications built in. Again, for me, it just always felt a little bit just just gimmicky and, 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 and lower utility. Um, what does uh, what I do like about the Edge is the the feel in the hand. It's it's got a better grip. Um, it's easier to handle with you know one hand navigation, and you can actually when you're when you're sliding. Um, from one screen to the next, that edge gives a nice little roll-in effect. So it's kind of cool where, where a flat surface screen display would would, would give you a, a slide in. You can actually kind of see a, a roll-in effect across the curve of the edge. So that's kind of cool. I like it. If you ask me what I would I buy an edge versus a, a standard, I would I would opt for the edge. I just like the way it looks. The functionality, at least from what I'd seen so far, eh, not so much. <laughs> So th there is some new stuff though with it with the S7 Edge. Um, yeah. So the, the the targets are bigger, so you can you can make more shortcuts, and when you slide That's it in, right. the edge is bigger. There there's also going to be um, 
I forget the I forget the terminology they use, but it's sort of like a live tile. You can put like news tiles in there, which will be live, so you don't have to run an app. You can slide in and see sports scores and stuff like that right in the edge. And and I agree with Dave. I, I like how it looks, but also it makes a bigger phone feel smaller in in one hand. It, it's it's just a it's just a cool design. I, I like it. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree, and, and you're right. We're again, we're waiting for the S7 Edge to come in, but you're right. Yeah, I forgot that that there are some new features there, and um, those features actually could be useful. I mean, one of the things that occurred to me were were that the notifications on the GS6 Edge Plus were sort of random and and didn't come up as with as much information as I was as I would like. Um, maybe they've got that down and, and making that strip a little bit larger. I think you said it was wider. Yep. Um, that that could be that could do the trick, you know, making it a little bit more useful. So, you know, kudos to Samsung. It's going to be interesting to see how Apple comes back. Usually, we don't hear from them until the September's, right? That's when they come out with their uh, their new iPhone launches. Um, but there have been a, a few more rumors about the iPhone Seven buzzing about the the web lately than typical. You know, it, it seems early that we're we're getting some of these rumors and leaks. So who knows? Maybe maybe they'll step out a little bit earlier. Usually we hear from them right around the time of Intel developers form uh, developers form IDF in September, but we'll see. Um, let's move right along, shall we? Let's let's talk about um, what's next. Uh, laptops, big gaming laptops. Um, we took a look at the MythLogic um, big bodacious. I don't know. Is it a 15 or a 17, Marco? Uh, this particular one that we looked at is a 15.6. Yeah. So, so is it a uh, is it a, is it a regular Clevo rebadge or, or what are we talking about here? Yeah, this machine's kind of it's kind of cool. It's it's from a brand that maybe most people aren't going to be familiar with. It's it's MythLogic and it, it's they're a boutique builder that they are using. Clevo is the ODM of this of this particular machine. It's a Clevo P750 DM sort of platform that MythLogic has has customized with lots of cool stuff. So the particular model we looked at, I'm probably going to pronounce this wrong. It's either it's either Demos or Demos. It's the MythLogic Demos gaming laptop um, model yeah, 1615S model. is the model we looked at. Now, MythLogic did some awesome stuff with this machine. So for one, it's got a desktop Core i7-6700K, so the fastest Skylake processor you can get in there right now. It's also got 16 gigs of 2.4 gigahertz DDR4 RAM, an NVIDIA GeForce GTX 980M with 8 gigs uh, dedicated GDDR5. You've got a super fast Samsung 950 Pro uh, M SATA, I'm sorry, M.2 SSD in the machine. You also have killer uh, networking and Creative Labs audio. So if you sort of took some of the best stuff you can get for desktops in terms of gaming related features so gaming focused hardware they crammed it into this machine and our man Josh reviewed it now there's nothing super flashy about the machine itself the Clevo platform doesn't have tons of cool external features it's kind of you know composite all around nothing too crazy it's not ugly but it's not over the top nice like something that uses custom you know carbon fiber or aluminum or anything like that. But what you end up with is a super, super fast notebook that can handle basically any game that you throw at it. So overall, pretty awesome machine. Like I think we saw the fastest PC Mark score from a notebook yet. It was something like 7,700 in PC Mark 7. You know, awesome 3D Mark score. It was the highest 3D Mark score we've seen from a notebook not including the Alienware notebooks when they were attached to the uh, graphics amp, to the external GeForce graphics. So overall, super nice, fast machine with the one caveat that almost all gaming notebooks has. Battery life's not so hot. You have so much horsepower in that thing, it's not going to stay untethered from the wall very long. I think we've got just over two hours web browsing and something like a 107 in the Battery Eater protest, uh, which is about in the middle of the pack. So... Really nicely appointed gaming notebook featuring the Clevo platform. And, you know, I should mention actually the, the killer networking. We we did an interview with Rivet Networks. Um, I think we've talked about it on a previous podcast as well. One of the only, actually the only company doing gaming-focused sort of Ethernet and wired and wireless Ethernet, so high-performance wired and wireless for gamers. Also Creative Labs Audio. You know, the particular machine we looked at was... Slightly over twenty seven hundred bucks, but you know that's 
for the hardware that's in here, compared to other gaming notebooks, really competitive, nice machine. You know, it's it's interesting. I mean, you talk about a $2,700 notebook. Some folks would be like, oh, my God, I could buy two of those. I could buy two notebooks for that price. Um, but it is a whole lot of horsepower in um, a 7.5-pound package. I was surprised. You know, usually when, when you talk about a, a notebook that's got a desktop CPU in it, and we're talking about, you know, the latest quad-core Skylake at 4 gigahertz and up, 4.2 gigahertz um, turbo boost, um, you're talking about usually a, a eight, ten, twelve pound machine. Um, you, you know, upwards of of uh, upwards of ten pounds usually for for that class of hardware. This thing gets in under eight pounds. It's seven and a half pounds. Um, and then the GeForce GTX 980M having eight gigabytes of GDDR5, that extra frame buffer. What's interesting there is okay now you've got a 4K screen. Can you actually game at 4K? Well, it turns out we did some tests there, and you actually can get just about playable frame rates, which for a notebook at 4K is unheard of usually, right? You're, you're, you're talking about just not enough horsepower typically for notebook um, notebook platform technology, uh, graphics or otherwise, to, to handle it. But we, we ran Middle Earth, Shadow of Mordor, um, DX11, high quality resolution, uh, or excuse me, high quality um, and high res, high quality image uh, settings. Um, 3840 by 2160 actually came in at 31 frames per second. It's just on the hairy edge of playable. Drop it down to 1440p, 2560 by 1440, and this thing's almost 60 frames per second. That's a that's a whole bunch of horsepower in a, in a notebook. Yep. Yeah, arguably, you could you could you could set up. I mean, just set up a desktop, um, a, a, a dock set up, right, where you pull in a you know, 30-inch panel and a, and a full-size keyboard if you want it, and bang, it's it serves as a desktop too, right? That That's what the high-quality settings on there too, and when you have a 4K display, you can turn down some of the eye candy, and it's still it's going to look pretty great. So if, you know, if you're right on the edge there like this one was, you can squeeze a few more frames out of it. Yeah, yeah. Gaming notebooks are, are, an, are an interesting beast. You know, there's, there's a lot of folks that... Um, chime in and, and really are passionate about them. They, they, there's a there's a there's a, a niche audience that loves these things, and then there's a bunch of folks that look at it and say, "Man, that's overkill for a notebook. Uh, it's a lot of horsepower. It's a lot of weight. It's a lot of cost. It's a notebook." Well, no. If you're a gamer or maybe even a workstation professional that wants serious horsepower. Um, you know, this is perfect if you know if if you're heading off to college and you want something that's going to have game, and you can actually cart it to a class. You could con you could conceive throwing this in the backpack at seven and a half pounds, right? Yeah, absolutely. Why not? I mean, it's it's more portable than lots of other gaming notebooks that are out there. And it's considering the horsepower, I they, seven and a half pounds is well within reasonable limits for a machine with this much horsepower. You mentioned. Um, you mentioned um, uh, Killer Networks technology. Um, we're, we're talking about their their wireless AC adapter technologies. Um, what does that do for for the average gamer? Well, there's two things that the setup has. So it has wired and wireless. So it does have the wireless AC in, in addition to the the wired killer. Now the wireless AC has uh, you know amplification and basically it's probably the highest performing 802.11 AC wireless adapter you can get. Plus it also has, you know, intelligent traffic uh, shaping and control targeted for gamers to make sure your gaming packets are, you know, getting in and out with priority. But you can also, um, it has a feature called Double Shot Pro where you could use the, the wired and wireless connection simultaneously and it intelligently uses the fastest connection for whatever scenario that you're in. So it's you know, networking technology, there's not a ton of additional performance that you can squeeze out of it. It's very mature tech, but Killers, well, Rivet is one of the, the only company really doing these little things specifically for gamers, which is, you know, I, I appreciate that as a gamer. I like that someone's trying to do something that's pretty cool. You know, they have a nice software control panel for managing all these features, too. You can you can see how your bandwidth is being used. You can prioritize apps. Some Some pretty cool stuff in there. Yeah. Paul, would you run a gaming notebook like this with all decked out? I would, and I do. I have the Asus ROG that we uh, reviewed last year. It's a Haswell laptop, but also with the GTX 980M 
And that one, as you were saying, it's actually 8.4 pounds. But I love the gaming laptops. I don't care about the... Well, I, I like Delta Books, but for my use, I love the gaming laptops. I take them on the road, and I have, you know, desktop performance from my hotel room or if I'm on vacation. You know, I have the same experience that I have pretty much at home on my desktop. So I love nice, these things. Nice. So you've got the, uh, the, the what is it, the G, G751 or something like that? It is the... G seventy five one JY. It's the, yeah, yeah, the yeah. last generation. That's a or, that's uh, a great uh, machine too. That machine is built awesome. It's super tight. Um, really cool design styling. It looks like a Ferrari in the back with the uh, red painted louvers for vents. That's yeah. that's an awesome machine. I like that's that. A, machine that's a, a beautiful notebook. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love that machine. I think at the time we had we had Joel Ruska writing for us, and he reviewed the original the G seven fifty. And he said, uh, the title of his, his article was, Buy This Notebook. <laughs> it's like, Joel, you can't just come out and say it like that. you got to tell them why. But it, was, it, was, it was good stuff. No, it's a, it's a great machine. And, um, uh, yeah, and so is this uh, Mythologic. It, interesting entrant. Do we, do we know anything about these guys, Mythologic, um, where, where they come from and where they're going? <laughs> I, I mean, we we know what we know about lots of the other boutique builders, gamers building machines, not just gamers. You know, uh, this particular machine. You know, gamers obviously they didn't design the Clevo machine, but it was obviously specced by a gamer that knows what they're doing. So, boutique builder that's making purpose-built machines, um, and they happen to just make some really nice hardware choices for this model. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. That that's the thing. That's what that's where these boutique builders come in. They they take some of these over the top configurations, burn them in, test them, make sure they're stable, and and deliver a validated product with a combination of hardware that you're not just going to get from a Dell or an HP or somebody like that. So, um, you know, really out on the on the edge, if you will, the bleeding edge, performance wise. Two fifty six gig Samsung nine fifty Pro Evo M two SATA SSD. Um, you know, all decked out, 16 gig of RAM, uh, and of course that GeForce GTX 9 AM and a, and a desktop CPU. It's like, yeah, it's it's loaded for bear, as they say. All right, well, let's talk about something that's a little bit more light duty, a little little less loaded for bear, but um, tasked with with a totally different usage model. Well, not totally, I wouldn't say, but but a very different usage model, and that would be HP's. Hot new Spectra X360 15T. We took a look at this. Our buddy Josh and I actually took a look at. Um, we we got two machines in uh, back last week. Um, I looked at the 4K infused version with with a 3840 by 2160 panel. Josh looked at the 1080p version. Uh, same, oh, almost the same setup. I had a Core i7 6500U under the hood. He had a Core i5 6200U. Um, 16 gig of RAM in my machine, 8 gig of RAM in his machine, same SSD. Um, really nice machine. I'm gonna I'm gonna share it out. It is. Uh, they start at uh, like 1150 round numbers. Don't quote me on that. Um, for the the base config, the 1080p version that Josh tried, and um, so there it is right there. Uh, I did a video review of it. Check it out on YouTube if you are uh, interested in seeing the video re review and walk around. Um, but as you can see, 15-inch machine, 4-pound 15-inch machine. So that's that's for starters. Very thin, very light, all aluminum design, 4 pounds. Um, and as you can see, it has the 360 swing hinge. Uh, HP's version, if you will, of the Yoga. They would probably cringe if they heard me say that that brand name, but um, it's it's basically a 360 swing hinge. That technology's been um, developed by multiple notebook manufacturers these days. And as you can see here, it um, will contort into various types of setups and usages um, with the display so that, you know, in this case, here the the keyboard's deactivated and it's, you know, it's a touch display. So now you've got sort of a, a kiosk um, you know, PC. You could conceivably see this sitting like that, maybe in your kitchen, just for a quick swipe to look at a recipe or to fire up Pandora for some mood music, and all that good stuff. Really nice design, um, brushed aluminum finish, and I'm gonna hold it up for you here now. Here's the uh, the 4K variant. The display on it, which isn't fired up yet, but um, oh, there we go. Sure. 
I'll get it into the frame actually too. The display on it is really nice. It's a glossy display, as you can see. You're getting a little bit of glare there. Um, but this is the 4K panel. The display uh, versus other 15-inch notebooks, and and obviously the watermark we're going to compare to right away is Dell's XPS 15 with their Infinity Edge display. That is a gorgeous machine, carbon fiber filled, and all that good stuff um, on the palm rest area. This is an all aluminum setup, but the display is actually every bit as bright, every bit as well saturated and and, and color balanced as the XPS's display. Um, the only thing, obviously, you get here, as you can see, is a little bit more bezel. Uh, it is what it is. It's not uh, Dell's Infinity Edge technology uh, or anything close to it, but it's still a very thin notebook, and as you can see, flips right down into a tablet if you want it. 15-inch, kind of an unwieldy tablet, to be honest, but you can conceive sitting in you know bed or on the couch and this format being useful, um, but the thing of it is, what's impressive is how thin and light you can get now, um, you know, that kind of horsepower in a thin and light machine like this. Also, uh, lots of other features on this SD card slot. You've got um, USB-C uh, as well as USB-3 as well as display port out. You know, just about every I.O. you can think of under the sun. And um, what you can see here is Bang & Olufsen. Uh, stereo quad stereo speakers, believe it or not, um, two right here in the in the palm rest area. And actually, the sound uh, the, we were taking bets, Paul. Right? <laughs> That's why I was laughing. That was the <laughs> longest the shows went before Marco's phone rang. I, I, I told uh, Dave yeah. before the show started that I'm taking the first 15 minute time block is when Marco's <laughs> phone goes off. <laughs> and, and they didn't get the hint. Right? That, I hung up on them the first time. They don't get the hint. I'll hang up on them twice. Uh, anyways, the, the the sound system is also pretty darn good as well. It's still notebook quality sound system, um, but it's um, it, you know it's a, it's a little bit more a little bit louder, a little bit more low end, a little bit more mid range available than you get in your average notebook. I wouldn't say it's night and day, but it's it's definitely an upgrade audio system as well. So we liked it. We gave it high marks, and um, you know if you're considering 15 inch machine. This guy, as well as Dell's XPS 15, I would I would put this one right in the running with that. Um, well built machine, different sort of setup. This this runs on Intel integrated graphics. Uh, the XPS has uh, discrete NVIDIA GeForce GTX 960 graphics, I believe. Um, but if you want super light, you want super thin, all aluminum, and uh, yeah, nicely configured. Uh, I like it. The Spectra 15. Marco, you like these machines too, but I think you like the 13-inch variant, right? Yeah, I, I like my notebook smaller, but you know, one one thing that to mention, you mentioned the bezel around the screen. Um, yes, the bezel's bigger than say an XPS 15 or 13, but because it swings into tablet mode, you need a spot for your thumb, so it sort of has to have that tablet bezel. Um, right. I'm sure if HP wanted to make that smaller, they could, but if you are going to flip it into tablet mode, you need a spot for your palms and your thumb. So that's kind of why it has a little bit of bezel. But yeah, I, I, I love what HP did with the design of those machines. Um, Michael just popped his head behind you. That was awesome. <laughs> that's my son, my 18-year-old. <laughs> everything from just um, the overall shape to the build quality, I, I dig the, the Spectres quite a bit. Yeah, the nice thing about about having some bezel to work with as well is that you can get your standard webcam placement. Um, I, I won't hold it up again, but the webcam is up in the top of the bezel where it traditionally is, and uh, where Dell has to locate that webcam in the bottom of the bezel down by the um, down by the keyboard area because there's just no room to put it in the Infinity Edge display up top. And so what you get is this unsightly angle of this webcam looking up your nose when you're when you're trying to do a Skype chat or something like that. Not so with this. So there's pros and cons to having some bezel. You can do some some good things. And 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 good point. Um, you know you you don't have a 360 degree swing hinge uh, with the XPS 15. This you do. The nice thing I I really like with the with the um, the the wide swing hinges. Are just the the infinite number of positions. I'm always I'm, I'm always in the kitchen, and I fire up my notebook while I'm making dinner. Put on some Pandora, you know, have email up, and you know maybe I'll browse the web or something like that in between shuffling some pans around. It's just something I always do. And when you stand over a notebook over a counter, if that 
display doesn't swing open wide enough, it's you don't get that perfect angle and you get glare or you get a you know an off angle view and not enough brightness. So that it, that hinge is useful in, in a lot of scenarios like that. Yeah. But um, yeah. Anyways, Paul, what do you think about this machine? I I, I like it. Not bad. Yeah, they're they're pretty neat. I was gonna ask you, does it get pretty loud with the quad speakers? I mean, can you can you fill a room with decent audio? Yeah, no, I mean, um, I, I keep going back to the thinness. It just, it's really super tight and super thin. I mean, look at that thing. It's like a almost a weapon. Um, the, no, the, I mean, the speakers are better. Um, the Bang & Olufsen uh, speakers are better. They, it's interesting, uh, HP, when, when Apple bought Beats, HP used to have Beats audio in their systems, uh, and it was kind of a was a branding thing, and when Apple bought them, obviously, Beats went away from, from HP Notebooks. And I never really liked the Beats stuff. Um, I always thought it sounded tinny to me, and I really thought Beats was overpriced. And you know, just my opinion, I never saw the value in what everybody was buzzing about with the Beats brand. Um, Bang & Olufsen, I can tell you from, from what I've heard so far, at least with this machine and with other machines that when we've been at press events with the Bang & Olufsen technology, um, it tends to have a, a little bit fuller, a little bit more natural sound. It's a little bit louder. I don't know. I, Probably about the same in terms of loudness, but I just you're getting some low end here and some mid range that you wouldn't normally get in a notebook. Are you going to replace that Bluetooth speaker in your kitchen or wherever you might stream to that um, it will pump out some real audio? Probably not. But if you're on the road and you're watching a movie and you need some decent audio, this definitely serves a purpose. Does that answer your question? It does. Good stuff. <laughs> It does. It does. All right. So yeah. So that was that was HP this week, and I mean we are just getting chewing through notebooks. We got a bunch in from Lene uh, Lenovo. Um, you're taking a look at one, right? The one of the um, X1 the, Carbon Yoga. You got that in, right? Yeah, the Yoga 700, and then they also sent the uh, I think a ThinkPad, maybe. Yeah, the Think. Yeah. All right. The Think. I'm sorry. We have Chris looking at the ThinkPad X1 Yoga. You are looking at a different. Uh, I have two. I have two. So I think you have the 900 S, maybe. Anyways, you get we get lots of notebooks coming in, which is great. <laughs> um, Marco, let's uh, let's wrap it up. But um, you wanted to talk about a couple of quick things that you're yeah. looking at that are coming, just yes. to tease the folks. I have some 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 things to talk about. So before I, I show what I want to show, um, we had a comment on the video from longtime reader Raymond Jeffries, uh, very very loyal reader. Um, Raymond, he buddy. says he was talking about the Galaxy S7 during the S7 segment. Says looks great. He's holding out for the Note 6 because he uh, he's hoping that the waterproofing uh, comes back. He's hoping the micro SD comes back, but he also wants that IR blaster. Samsung got rid of the IR blaster on the S7. Ah. He wants to use that feature. So. Uh, astute observation there, Raymond. I and, forgot all about the IR blast, Raymond. Good job, man. Yeah, man. That's so missing. I have a couple of uh, of sneak peeks stuff that I'm working on. I was traveling, so I'm a little behind, but uh, I'm, I'm I'm hoping to crank out some content very soon. Um, while we're talking mobile phones, I need to hold up this guy. Um, this is the Lumia 950 XL. I have finally been able to play with it. And now I'm approaching this review a little bit differently than the 950 because from the announcement of this phone, I envisioned it replacing my Lumia 1520. So as soon as I got it, I set it up as my daily driver. You know, this isn't, uh, it's not stock. It's set up with all my stuff, set up the way I like it with my crazy home screen there. Look at that. And, um, a couple of hints so far. So because this has the faster SOC than the than the 950, performance is actually better. It's not better across the board, but definitely better graphics. My experience so far, if I were to graph it, has been a sawtooth pattern. <laughs> Out of the box experience was actually not great. Um, a couple of updates came through, and it got much better in terms of the OS. And then the experience got bad again with some app updates that seem to have since been reversed. So I have a lot to wrap my head around with this thing, but but the ultimate Windows phone for now until that HP uh till that HP phone comes out. So this review is coming soon, maybe by Wednesday I'm working on. Now, this is something very cool. No one else is going to care but me, but this is cool stuff. As many of you know, I've uh, I've gone it's all through about a, you, so 
right? I've gone I've gone through a bit of a transformation in the last year and a half. Lost 130 pounds, and the way I basically did it was um, was eating right and boxing. I fell in love with boxing workouts, and a company called Hixo re- is is working on these new boxing. Sensors. Now, these this is wearable. It's a wearable for boxers. Now, these little sensors go in your boxing gloves, and there's an app you run. It's going to be for iOS and Android, but there's an app that'll run on a mobile device, and it tracks your punch count, your intensity, um, you know, which punches that you're throwing. It's just it's picture taking you know a Fitbit or a Microsoft band you know a fitness wearable but laser focusing it on, on combat sports so on boxing to get real accurate data on a, on a boxing type workout or a combat type workout so I'm gonna do a quick and dirty video review and uh, review of those things I'm, I'm actually really excited to play with it I'm hoping I can shoot some video of that tomorrow that's kind of cool. finally let me, let me jump in. What, yeah, what was that I, I just had a question on that that's, yeah. that's Cool stuff. So you've got, do you have like an accelerometer and a pressure sensor? What what kind of sensors are on board those things? So there's um, there's a three axis accelerometer in here. I, I don't remember. There are other sensors in it, but so you have to orient it a certain way under your wraps. So th- this will be under your wraps and in, inside your gloves. So it can track when you're throwing a jab, a cross, a hook, or an uppercut. Nice. But then you can also you can also count how many of each punches per round that you threw, how intense your workout was, and the app can actually because it has a motion sensor in there, actually track the arc of your punches to make sure your technique is right. Wow! So it's it's you know I'm kind of giddy over it. It's a simple <laughs> thing. They're not going to be released for a little while, but you know you get like a charging base. They connect wirelessly. But I'm excited to play with it, and I'm hoping to get some of the pros at the boxing glove, uh, boxing club that I work out at, to try them on, and I'll get some video of some some real martial artists using them too. So, it should be fun. I'm just I'm excited to mess with them. They're That's pretty cool. cool. Yeah, I, I I I was into martial arts for a few years myself, and um, that would be really cool to have that kind of tech to check, you know, check out how your what your what your form is. Exactly. Like I love my my Microsoft band for telling me what my heart rate was, how many calories did I burn, but it doesn't tell me anything about boxing. So if you want to see, are you getting better? Are you throwing more punches? Are you throwing harder punches? Um, Are you throwing enough power punches versus you know jabs? Um, Just stuff like that. Are are you balancing between arms? You know, so you're not getting completely fried in one arm while you're working. Now this is for fitness. For an actual fight, you wouldn't care, but. In terms of fitness, are you keeping it balanced on each side? There's just lots of cool data that you can you know generate with something. Yeah, no, great for training. Yeah, yep. yeah. And now, finally, we can announce. Well, 95 percent announce a contest. We well, have the um, we have the specs from an uh, a, a gaming rig that AMD is going to sponsor for us. Um, I am pulling up the email right now. So we are going <laughs> to give away a full gaming PC. It will be powered by AMD's fastest APU, the 7890K. Um, it will have an MSI uh, A88 based motherboard, 16 gigs of G-Skill RAM, a Patriot Blast 120 gig SSD, Corsair power supply, all inside a nice mini tower case. We are just hammering out the details on when we're going to start the contest and when it's going to end. And um, I think the parts are going to come to me, and I'm going to build something. We're not. We're, we're working that out now. But yes, it's coming. We can finally announce our next giveaway. Thank you, AMD. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> nice. So um, okay, yeah. Just uh, just swing by the site, uh, participate, get noticed in the community. We're going to do that again. Uh oh. Uh-oh. Like I think lost I just him. Marco drop. Oops. Wait. There he is. Oh, that what, was quick. What the heck just happened? So, yeah, I think I just lost my connection for a second. What we're going, we, we will probably keep it simple. Just come by the site, participate on the site, participate on our, our couple of Facebook pages, and we'll randomly pick a winner. There you go. There you go. Cool. And, and courtesy of the folks at AMD, uh, I assume it'll be VR ready if you're in for VR, right? 
Um, I'm, I don't think it will have quite the horsepower for a true VR experience with just the APU, but it's going to be you know a, a nice oh. quad core machine. I, I actually we have another question just came in on YouTube. Um, going back to Samsung for a second, if you don't mind, uh, yeah. is there a big is there a big difference uh, between the Snapdragon and Samsung's uh, CPUs in terms of LTE support? Um, I think I can just answer that quick. Yeah. Uh, not, not really, no. The, there's a single S7 model that basically covers all the LTE bands, if I'm correct, right, Dave? Yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, so it, not really. Now, if you buy a phone from a carrier, it will be SIM locked, so you can't just go willy-nilly and connect it to any carrier unless you have an unlocked phone. <clears> but uh, no, the, it's, it's, I think they support all of the major LTE networks. Yeah, so yeah, that's a pretty standard issue these days. Yeah. And, and actually, before we go, we'll, let's let's talk real quick about um, Paul. You've got something in the works for a, a keyboard, right? You looked at a pretty high-end keyboard coming up. I did, I did. If you're if you're into mechanical keyboards, you're probably familiar with Das Keyboard, one of the pioneers back in the day. They've released several uh, high-end models through the years, but they're always geared towards productivity. And these days, mechanical keyboards are popular, and you have all the gaming peripheral companies coming in. So they created a gaming division called Division Zero, and they've released their first gaming keyboard, this bad boy right here. Yo! X X40 Pro has some dedicated uh, macro keys, and for the first time for a DAS keyboard, an actual LED backlight, so yay for that. That looks cool. It is cool, and he has a... You can swap the face plates on there as well. They sent a couple for us to check out. And what's cool about these, they're aluminum. They're not cheap, chintzy plastic. So this is huh. the quality on this is actually really nice. Better than I was expecting for, you know, usually when you see a gaming keyboard with the wild graphics, it's kind of, you know, might be a little bit chintzy. This is not. It's actually really nice. So we will have a review of that probably, what, later this week, guys? Yeah, I would um, say, yeah, maybe uh, maybe tomorrow actually. I yeah. gotta see what I'm gonna put up tomorrow. <laughs> Dave's traveling. Dave's going. Dave gets to go to San Francisco and check out GDC. So I'll be uh, I'll crank that out for you tomorrow, Paul. I think. There you go. So yeah, swing by the site, folks. Uh, check out Paul's latest coverage of mechanical keyboards for gamers from Das 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 Keyboard. It must be German, right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, and also stay tuned for details of our upcoming contest where uh, sweepstakes, giveaway, whatever you want to call it, where we will be uh, giving away a an AMD infused full up gaming PC, and uh, it'll be it'll be a, a delicious piece of technology to be sure. So make sure you stop by, get in on that. You can find us at hothardware.com. That is our home on the web. Facebook.com slash hot hardware, Twitter.com slash hot hardware, and of course here on YouTube where we encourage you to thumb up this video if you liked it. Thanks for hanging out with us. And subscribe to our channel at hot hardware vids, youtube.com slash hot hardware vids. And uh, that about wraps us for today, gentlemen. Appreciate your participation in this week's webcast, two and a half geeks. Who's the half geek today? Is it Paul or or me? I think I'm the half geek. <laughs> Yeah, I'll I'll, t- I'll take it today. I'll take the designation. I'm all excited know, dude, for. Dude. I'm excited for a wearable, so I'm the half geek. Oh yeah, you're definitely the half geek <laughs> with the wearable. You're right. You're right. Yep, yep, that qualifies you. <laughs> Thanks for stopping by, everybody. Take care. Have a great week.